Oh, hello everybody and welcome to uh, the next IMI webinar. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. It's going to be an exciting topic of discussion. We're looking at connected retailing today. Um, it's been a year of lockdowns and gradual lifting of regulations and the cautious hopes of a return to normality. Um, it's been you know, a tough time for everybody and uh, what that normality will look like in the future, we'll have to wait and see. It's had a major impact on the way vehicle retailing uh, approaches have uh, moved forward, looking at a digital journey and uh, taking customers on that. Buyer expectations have leapt forward since the beginning of 2020 and online purchasing is sec now second nature. Um, what, so what was once a reluctant motor industry uh, engaging with the online world has now shifted to an unprecedented acceleration in, in the pace of development in that area. Um, but what does this mean for vehicle retailing and what does it mean for the future as well? Well, we've got a, a great panel of um, speakers with us to help us get through this. So we have James Chu, uh, Richard Tavener, Rob Su, uh, S uh, excuse me, Rob, Rob Severs from uh, iVendi, and we've got Neil Smith as well, who's an automotive consultant. Um, so I guess, you know, we should really kick this off by looking at, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has sent a lot, huge shockwaves through all areas of life and transformed the way that the auto industry uh, approaches retail uh, vehicle retail sales. Um, one of the biggest changes has been the consumer behavior and expectations in this and the move to a connected retailing um, uh, form. So I guess I should really turn to James first to open the discussion and take a look at it. Thank you, James, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, we've heard a lot from Boris Johnson over the past 12 months, but it was Winston Churchill that once quoted never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, and I think there's been the learnings and the actions of the past 12 months have massively accelerated the industry. Um, I think uh, when the announcement was made on the 23rd of March, uh, I think in the morning of the 24th, uh, we actually had a meeting in our offices in Manchester. Um, and uh, from that day, a lot of things changed. Um, so from a retailer perspective, sales processes, just stopped. There was uh, a model that was focused on appointments, test drives, face-to-face -face selling, which just to be thrown out the window. Um, and we're now really looking at, we see four distinct sales processes that have emerged over the past 12 months. Some have been there in, in some form, but they're probably clearly four distinct processes. Um, all have got pros and cons, and we're going to touch on those later on in this session. Um, we've seen uh, yeah, most of the market has had to retail vehicles on a much reduced uh, operational overhead. Um, again, I'm, I'm sure like everyone needs reduced costs uh, and government support certainly helped everybody during the past 12 months. Um, and we know that vehicle sales were, have been down, um, but actually some underlying profitability has been up for many businesses. Um, and certainly it's brought in new, new efficiencies into the business. So that's another great, great learning. Uh, I want to dig deeper into those as well um, as we go in uh, over the next hour. I think at the back end of lockdown one, we saw click and collect widely adopted. I think once everyone was a little clearer on what they could do, there was uh, a, more of a scramble to get click and collect models up and running. Um, we then obviously had distant selling, uh, which pre-COVID, I think struck fear into the heart of uh, many retailers. Uh, the thought of registering the vehicle or just selling the vehicle online and it coming back uh, was a big problem. This kind of moved into a, a necessary evil, it being the only way to trade. Uh, and, and now we see some retailers fully embracing it, um, learning how to maximize the opportunity whilst minimizing risks. Um, the rise of the pure online player it would be remiss of me not to mention Kazoo and Cinch on the call and there's Kazam and Cars and various others. Um, you know, this has presented a consumer with a simple end-to-end -end process um, culminating in kind of home delivery or a click and collect model, depending upon uh, the channel. Um, and then on the back of this, we've seen a huge demands for retailers wanting to add a buy button onto the website. Uh, there was as much demand for buy buttons as there was for toilet rolls at the time. So uh, it was uh, probably a global shortage of buy buttons. Um, however, I think it'd be fair to say, you know, some of the feedback we've had um, where uh, I think 
people have been honest is is the consumers weren't just going through the whole process and buying online they were doing parts of it online but not really fully buying online in in, in, uh, in most of these solutions albeit we appreciate that the kazoo and cinch models you know do do form part of that so again we'll touch on some numbers later on so so what does the consumer want moving forward um well the interesting thing is is i think there's a generation of covid customers and these covid customers have gone um effectively or virtually gone um and it, the next round of customers won't have bought a car this way um they will be customers that bought a car when no one had heard of covid and i think we've got to understand that and, and and i guess it's going to be what do i want personally as a consumer well i'd like a more streamlined process that fits the way i want to buy a vehicle and i don't think i'm the only consumer out there so um neil's got a lot of thoughts on this area uh, I think there's a, uh, many of you will know Neil, but his background with Imperials uh, and a short stint with Kazoo is, is, is going to help with some of the thinking around that, seeing it from, from both sides. Um, and we've got some new data, which is looking at the online shopper versus the online car buyer. Rob's going to talk about that later on as well. So we've seen that retailers um, have adapted, but consumers, I think, have embraced the changes as well. Um, they didn't have a great deal of choice if they, they needed vehicles and there wasn't a great deal of choice. So they had to embrace it. So I'm going to hand over to Richard Taverner now. So Richard is the COO and co-founder of Ivendi. He's going to discuss this in more detail. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, so yes, we, um, we got a, a, a graphic that we're just putting up on the screen there. So one of the things we've done that we thought would, would help this discussion was to look at um, the different types of consumer behavior that we're seeing in the market at the moment and categorize these into three groups. So those are the online buyers, the channel hoppers, and the in-person. So if we look first at online buyers, I mean, these are often seen as the younger audience. Um, although what we're seeing is typically, um, th there's a range of people across age groups that are using this uh, method of buying at the moment. Essentially, these are people who are prepared to complete the entire process online. That's from research right through to delivery. Of course, I think one of the key things is a lot of people have been forced into this behavior during lockdowns, but clearly some of the changes we've seen in the market are going to mean that that behavior is, is here to stay and is going to grow. And the next group, the channel hoppers, this is where the bulk of buyers are likely to reside at least in the short term. Um, these people begin the journey online, but then they switch to more traditional methods along the way. Sometimes that's because they prefer to be guided through the final stages. Um, but perhaps this also demonstrates the complexity of the sales process. You know, we know that selling vehicles is not straightforward. And then the final group, the online, well, this is the, obviously this is the old school approach. And these are the people who like an entirely physical experience in the showroom. Uh, these people also take typically the longest time from research to purchase. And I think it's clear that um, we'll go and talk about this in a bit more detail in a few minutes. But I think that th this is the group that's going to significantly uh, contract as the other two groups significantly expand. So I'm going to hand over to Neil now, and Neil's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the stuff that uh, dealers have been doing. Thank you, Richard. Um, so, yeah, let's just talk about those three types of buyer. So back in uh, Imperial days, prior to pandemic, we were identifying those buyers at that point, and we saw and developed systems up to uh, probably the start of lockdown one actually was when we launched our online site which was sort of directly uh, focusing on those first um, level of buyers the online buyers uh, but also the channel hoppers so we wanted to give our consumers uh, the opportunity to buy the vehicle the way they wanted to buy it and some of those um, consumers were looking for that end-to-end -end online process uh, but very few and recent um research in January carried out by Watcar identified that 10% of uh, in-market buyers would be looking to complete the transaction fully online and pay full up for the vehicle before having it delivered. Uh, and for us at Imperial, those numbers sort of stacked up uh, during the first part of last year. And we were 
pretty fixated on delivering a, a buying journey that accommodated for those three types of buyers, the physical in-person buyers, the channel hoppers and the online buyers. Um, and I think if as dealers, if you're looking to maximize uh, the potential market, then you've got to be looking at those three types of buyers and being able to accommodate for them in a blended online and offline journey. And those that aren't really pushing forward in that way are going to be restricted in in terms of the market that they are able to attack. The online buy, uh, the online disruptors are pretty much only targeting the online buyers. So they are only looking at 10% of the market, which leaves 90% of the market for traditional dealers to start to play in that space by developing those online transaction models. Um, and I suppose looking at those online transaction models, we've got to look at that digital sales journey and then understand also how profitability can be maintained throughout that journey. So it's probably a good opportunity to now to move into the next section and just um, have a little understanding about that sales journey and that profitability piece. Hmm. Thank you, Neil. Um, just before we do uh, shift into the next section, um, I just want to remind everyone who's on here watching, there's a Q&A uh, box down the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions that are cropping up as, as the presentation is going on and the discussion is taking place, then feel free to shove all those questions in there. And then we'll either try and get to the questions uh, during the discussion or we'll keep some time spare at the end of the of the webinar to answer your questions. Um, and if all else fails and we run out of time completely, then we will definitely try and get back to you offline and make sure that all your questions are answered. Uh, also, at this point, I just want to um, state that we're going to run a poll right now, uh, which will be popping up on your screen in a little while. So please keep uh, an eye out for it. Uh, the question is, how concerned are you about the digital disruptors? Uh, we're really keen to uh, get your feedback on this. So if you take uh, just a few seconds to answer that, we'd be really grateful. Um, so yes, as Neil said, shall we move on to the next section, which is about managing the digital sales journey and maintaining profitability. So I guess a very simple question is, how can retailers build and manage a vehicle retailing journey that meets the needs of modern consumers. Uh, Richard, how about you? Yeah, thanks, James. Um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, one of the challenges we face in our sector is that vehicle retailing is really, really complex. Uh, however, it's clear that consumers just want simplicity. You know, they don't understand the complexities of the process that we have to work within. And I think it's really interesting whenever you talk to somebody outside of our industry, as, as we often do, they really don't understand all the different complexities and, and nuances. And um, that, I think, is, is a real barrier to being able to give consumers the simplicity they want. Um, so we've got, a, we've got a slide that we're going to put up here, which just looks at the various different retail models. Uh, and also comparing the, the cost of sale, if you like, with all of those four models. So the first of those is a pure online model. Lots of talk about this in the last 12 months. So, you know, there are numerous surveys that have been done over the years and, and even very recently about the numbers of online buyers. And if you look at those different surveys, the, you know, the percentage of people willing to buy entirely online ranges from anywhere between two and 9%. But of course, a lot comes down to the definition, you know, how do you define purely online? And I think it's clear a lot of the processes that are, that are happening at the moment are not purely online. And um, there are elements that are being done online, but with everything that's happened in the last 12 months, they, you know, consumers have been forced and dealers have been forced into are going down that, that particular model, but there are big parts of the process that are not being done online. Um, so, you know, how much is actually pure online and how much was just driven by a lack of options due to lockdowns and restrictions on how dealers were able to operate? I think one of the clear, clear things is, you know, the, the, the new entrants to the market, Kazoo and Cinch, are certainly going to drive behavioral changes in consumers. You know, ultimately these guys are alerting consumers to the fact that online buying is available. And, you know, I, th I think that that's, that's good news for the sector as a whole, because there's some very big marketing budgets being put behind changing consumers' perception and ultimately 
changing consumers' behaviour. So if consumers start to recognise that buying a car online is, is possible and dealers are, have got or are starting to get better technology to enable that to happen, then obviously dealers need to make sure that they're really, really making that clear on their website. Um, because if consumers are looking for that, then if that's really, really clear, that's going to help dealers compete and capture these buyers. Um, the, the, the other um, interesting uh, area then is the online and concierge. So we expect to see a lot more of these uh, kind of deals, these kind of transactions going forwards. You know, what car recently published some stats that showed around 82% of consumers want to actually go and see the dealer. So that means only 18% don't. Um, so, you know, are, 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 but are these in the pure online at the moment? Um, and I think one of the difficulties with surveys is what people say in surveys and what they do in reality, you know, is very different. Um, and we've got a situation in the last 12 months where consumers and dealers have been forced to operate in a certain way to work around the lockdown restrictions. I think as we start to see the market opening up, we'll start to see uh, more behavior based on what suits the consumer and based around the technology that dealers have got available to them, which is better now than it ever has been, albeit more work needs to be done. But, you know, for, for those online and, and, and concierge type uh, models, you know, that is where a consumer can take the best elements from the online process, but that can be backed up with a dealer concierge process to help guide the consumer through the process. And I think it's logical that that's going to be a, a huge growth area and, and arguably is going to be a stronger area going forwards than, than pure online. Uh, the third area, um, hybrid stroke blended. Um, you know, as we said, either through choice or necessity, significant numbers of buyers um, that visit the showroom before uh, concluding the sale. Um, we talked about this complex model, and I think part of the complexity in the process means that consumers are having to visit the showroom. You know, if you look at part exchange, for example, you know, uh, uh, there is a number of uh, things happening around part exchange at the moment, but still for many, before the sale can be completely concluded, consumers are going into the showroom to get that vehicle appraised and get the deal, deal finalised. But as technology evolves, you know, the need to complete some of these things face to face is going to reduce. You know, again, part exchange is a um, is a good example. You know, there's technology that's come to market and is coming to market, which allows consumers to carry out self appraisals. And, um, you know, that will then give dealers greater confidence to allow those dealer deals to be concluded and um, without the need for the customer to to attend the showroom if they don't want to um, and then you know the in-person model you know that is the traditional way and this has still got a part to play because uh, some consumers do still prefer this traditional model you know in the good old days you know when i was selling cars back in the 90s 100 percent of cars were sold this way um, and, you know, I, I remember the first email inquiry and I took back in 1996 and, you know, everybody in the dealership was saying that there's no way this customer will buy a car, you know, because if you were going to buy a car, you'd come in, you, you wouldn't send an email. And funnily enough, the customer did buy a car. Um, but, you know, then, then came websites, you know, vehicle images, finance tools were introduced um, around 14, 15 years ago. And I guess arguably that's the point that consumers first started to channel hot. That's when they first had the ability to con conduct part of the sales process online, that being finance quoting and, and, and finance approval. Um, but you know, many, many of the other tools in our sector are, are pretty new. If you take things like online reservation, the shopping cart solutions that we're seeing now allowing a consumer to buy a vehicle online, they are pretty new and they've been driven predominantly by the pandemic. Um, but that certainly accelerated the shift, meaning that traditional full in-person model, um, I think is going to be the first of those four models to go. So, I mean, you look at that and you say, well, that's great, but so, so what? 
Well, you know, we talked about cost earlier and what's the cost of these channels and the cost associated with them? And what are the benefits to dealers in being able to evolve their business models and potentially, um, you know, reduce those models down to maybe two or three models instead of four? And, um, you know, online, it, it can be a very efficient way of doing business, but comes with a number of pros and cons. You know, some of the con cons involve having less control over the customer. And the regulated environment we're in at the moment, that, that could be deemed to be okay, but less control over the sale of add-ons in a pure online process, well, that's proven to be a problem. And, and we know, you know, anybody who's starting to do business online, and I think, you know, the, the new online players, Kazoo and Cinch, will all be struggling to sell uh, add-ons as part of the vehicle sale. And then that matters because, of course, those are, you know, a significant contributor to the bottom line. And um, so that's a bit of a disadvantage to the pure online model. Now, technology is evolving, but it's still unproven as to whether even, even with better technology, consumers are going to go and buy those products in a pure online model. And um, arguably, um, the highest cost is, is the offline sales model, uh, the traditional model. Of course, though, we can't move away from the physical showroom completely. Um, you know, the physical showroom process ultimately supports the hybrid and blended model. And I think, you know, no one would believe that we're going to have a world where there'll be no no cart showrooms. However, the sales model can evolve. And although there may be a physical showroom, the way that showroom operates could be completely different in future and, and far more efficient and therefore, you know, much easier to manage from a cost basis. Um, so I think another emerging market is going to be the online and concierge model. That's where consumers can do it all online if they want to, um, but they can rely upon the fact that there's a human at the end of a phone or at the end of a chat solution for where they can't progress or where they feel as though they need some help. And then they can switch even into a hybrid model if they need to. Um, and I think that's an area where certainly this challenge around the sale of add-on products can be overcome with better processes and systems built around the online and concierge model and indeed the hybrid and, and blended model. And um, so, yeah, talked earlier about how do we potentially take those four models and maybe amalgamate them down into three or even two processes. Um, and I think that's certainly going to be very, very possible in um, the short to medium term. Um, you know, we, we, we've, we talked about the what car data earlier, and uh, we compiled our own data just over three years ago that showed virtually the same percentages. So, you know, the, the consumer um, intent and consumer behaviours haven't really shifted. And um, both of those surveys pointed to a huge desire by the consumer to have face to face engagement. You know, in many cases, they do want to touch and feel the car. And um, so, yeah, I mean, we've seen during the pandemic and um, people have blended uh, the offline sales process with the hybrid process. Um, and, you know, they've been driven to do that through necessity. But we've seen some kind of odd ways of working through talking to dealers because some of the technology has not quite been there. Um, you know, we've seen docu dealers sending out Word documents for customer information, customer finance applications, et cetera. Of course, that comes with a real GDPR risk. But I think it's been a case of needs must with businesses being forced to adapt rapidly in the last 12 months. However, I think a lot of technology has evolved rapidly in the last 12 months. And dealers have now got at their disposal more technology than ever before to help them uh, create business models which evolve around an online concierge model or a hybrid and blended model uh, supported by online and offline. Um, so I think ultimately moving forwards, where do we think things are going to go? Well, I think those are online uh, concierge and hybrid models are going to be the best for dealers to pursue. Um, virtually all dealers have managed to reduce their operational costs in the last 12 months. And I'm guessing, you know, everybody's going to want to keep those operational costs at those kind of levels moving forwards. The question is, can it be maintained? 
Well, I think by adapting the business process, evolving some of the technology that's available, uh, it can. And it can also be done whilst making the whole process more efficient for the consumer, which if that can be achieved, it, you know, is a, is a classic win-win. Um, so um, we've got the poll question. Um, don't forget to answer the poll if you haven't done so already. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rob now. Um, and Rob's going to talk to you a little bit around some of the um, information that we've been seeing through our data. Cheers, Rich. So I think you mentioned before about the um, the new digital disruptors that all begin with C. They're starting to, or you'd hope they're probably going to start to normalise online buying amongst consumers. And I think the the, the, the point that sort of we want to pick up here is with the right technology, you know, any traditional retailer can start to to do all of the things that those uh, big digital disruptors are doing. Because as you'll see in a bit, whilst the technology is maturing. We've all still got some of the same challenges, which I'll touch on in a bit. But before I touch on them, I think it'd be good, um, either James or Georgia, would you be able to share the uh, results of the first poll that we've done? Okay, so we ask you how concerned you were about the, uh, about the new digital disruptors on the scene. So 0% uh, extremely, but uh, a good chunk of 30% seem <coughs> very concerned with 51%, which is the majority, not really at all. So interesting sort of almost 50-50 split there sort of uh, on the fence. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's an opportunity. As, uh, as Neil said before, uh, they're really going after the 10% of market, but what it will do is probably start to normalise what is pure online retail and, and bring an element of the perception of simplicity to the customer. And I think to Neil's point before, um, there's... There's three different types of consumer, and there's no reason why a traditional retailer can't accommodate all of those and play in 100% of the market space, not just the 10. So I mentioned before about, you'll have seen yourselves, if you start to look, there's been sort of a, a big take up in technology and various different solutions appearing on car dealers' websites, especially during the pandemic. So we were still selling cars, um, dealerships, Showrooms were, were most dealership showrooms were, uh, were physically closed, but they were still selling cars. And dealers have have, have reacted, and we, we, we've matured, and 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 we've evolved. And we've seen uh, various different creative solutions that have come to play. But <clears throat> the need for a buy button, as we alluded to before, we're starting to see those pop up on most dealers' websites. And providing you've got the right people and processes and culture behind those, the technology will work for you. But I mentioned before about challenges. And one of the things that we see, given the level of finance that we, uh, that we um, undertake through our platform, is if you break down the various different elements of the platform, one thing that car buying consumers online do expect, it's immediacy. And one of the big challenges that we, we see, and this is all dealers, including those that all begin with C, the new digital disruptors, it's the facilitation of finance in that journey. So we've done, a, we've, done a, we've done a study and we found out that on average, this is across the many different lenders that we interface with at iVendi. On average, it takes two hours, 21 minutes from the point in time a consumer says, I want to apply for finance and sends their details over, two hours, 21 minutes to get back a confirmed positive or negative decline. So the customer sat there to lend the thumbs. And if you don't believe me, go and have a look at some of the FAQs today. That certainly exists, and I know I've seen it on a few of the sites. Go and have a look at some of the FAQs and some of those digital disruptor sites, and you will see in there, there's questions about how long will it take for me to get an acceptance to my finance. And there is words to the effect of, it may take some time for us to do this. So we've all got the same challenges. But I think as the technology, you know, the, 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 the technology which they've got on their site, it's becoming commonplace now, and it's available through many different providers to those, uh, to, those to, to those retailers. And I think one other point that we sort of have seen is a sort of great piece of research from, um, I think it was uh, Judge Service a, a month or two ago, where it was looking about sort of changes during the, during the pandemic and during lockdown. And one thing it did, did firmly highlight is the role and the importance of the traditional dealer website in driving traffic. So we mentioned before, showrooms, closed so 
consumers couldn't naturally visit them. So they've still been visiting the dealer website if they've done before, but all of those lead generation calls to action, which traditionally exist on the website, those calls to action have gone through the roof during the pandemic. And the point is, we know the website's working, those call to actions are working. If the buy now operations existed and the, 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 the relevant functions to support the part exchange and the other components exist on the website, you probably see if you haven't got them already, that they will start to, uh, they will start to take, take effect. Now, just before I hand over to Neil, who'll talk a little bit about some of the processes and the, the, the culture of the technology, I just want to draw up a slide, um, James, oh, or George, sorry, here we go. And what, what this slide represents, so the, 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 the numbers at the bottom represents the time of day. And what each of the bars represents, it's the, uh, it's the, the proportion of customers that are doing stuff online at that hour of, of the day. And the green bars, sorry, if I'll start with the, the green bars. So the green bars represent is when customers are online, sorry, the blue bars represent when customers are online browsing. So typically they're on, they're on dealer websites and they're clicking through to a full page ad. And we can see this based off the, the volumes of quote requests that we get back. So what you can see there by looking at the blue lines is that customers genuinely are online 24 hours a day. You can see it. Even if you look at midnight and you look at one, two, three, four, five o'clock in the morning, there's traffic. There's traffic to the website and, and we all know that. That sort of peak for, for, for browsers tends to happen about sort of tea time. So from about six o'clock to, um, to about nine o'clock, but there is, there is a good proportion of traffic throughout the day. However, if you compare those blue lines to the green lines, what the green lines represent, that's when customers are actually online submitting finance applications. And the key point here is it's not really 24 hour, like the browsers, 78% of those online finance applications and that real buy-in as opposed to browsing activity tends to occur nine till five during office hours. Now, what I don't know to that is the reasons why, it's just a reflection of fact in terms of what we see at the data. But I did see a piece of research from Autotrader in one of their recent market reviews where it was talking about some of the challenges and Autotrader itself was, was talking about the importance of the hybrid model. And one of the frustrations Autotrader drew out in that research, I think the number was about 50, 51% of customers want some help with finance. So what we suspect is happening here is that the customers, because the customers aren't used to doing it or don't feel completely confident doing it, and they, they want some help and expertise from the dealer, we suspect the call and or the email in the dealer during those office hours who's then telling the consumer to, uh, to complete that journey online. So Neil, over to you. We'll talk a little bit more about the, the, uh, the culture and the processes. Thanks, Rob. Uh, yes, yeah, so if we can pull up the next slide on the traditional sales model. So um, prior to digital online disruptors and some of that journey being completed online, the traditional model was a very linear model and was based on showroom visit, uh, be that unannounced, unsolicited or appointment. It was linear for a couple of reasons. One was that we were, as retailers, uh, keen to control the customer when they arrived at our site and make sure that we went through a controlled process. Um, it was also because I think, as Richard mentioned earlier, buying a car is a very complex process. So we needed to control that journey on site to make sure that we ticked all the boxes and the consumer had the opportunity to ask any questions, test drive the vehicle. We were gonna value their part exchange, go through a company sell. Um, and there were various points within that process that we were looking to trial, close or close the customer uh, and use some sort of psychological elements to get them through the process to the point where we could close the deal. Now that worked and derivations of that worked for, for us at Imperial for many years. Uh, but as we saw the online journey start to come into being and that would have started with part exchange valuations, probably it's been the first point where a consumer could self-serve. We then started to see the addition of uh, other elements of that being uh, offered over to the customer to self-serve. So if we could move to the next slide, please, Georgia. So the connected retailing model, and it's um, again, what we've alluded to already based on this online concierge blended hybrid journey. Uh, we can see here that there are various points now, uh, specifically uh, those colored in red on this slide where 
these these elements can be completed online or self serve uh, sorry self serve online by the consumer or can be completed in the showroom or a mix of both via maybe the contact center and some communication there. So I think what we've got to consider now is how we facilitate this journey, which is far more flexible than it was before. It's no longer linear. The consumer can choose to value their part exchange on one day. They can then come back a couple of days later and carry out a finance application online. They can then decide to pop into the showroom to test drive a vehicle. They may then decide to go back home. Uh, and start to research again. Uh, they may decide to have the vehicle delivered. They may decide to order it and collect it. So there's, there's so many elements to this journey now that what was already a complex journey is now far more complex and varied. And I think retailers now, and, and we certainly did in Imperial, we got to the point where we had to ensure that some of these elements, uh, specifically things like the qualification and finance, uh, finance application, the part exchange valuation, those were available to do online from a self-serve perspective. And they had to be simple and easy and had to deliver back to the consumer very quickly uh, a result. So it wasn't good enough to expect the consumer to wait for two days to get some answer on a finance application. So it had to be uh, automated to a greater degree. And yeah, if we don't start to deliver this model to the consumer from a traditional retailing point of view, then those online disruptors will be taking a uh, bigger and bigger proportion of the market. And that proportion of the market will be those consumers now who are time poor, those consumers who move from that mixed hybrid uh, blended model and get more confident because of the appetizing and the trust that's being built in these online consumers, um, they will move to that pure online. So we have to, as a as a industry really ensure we accommodate for all three of those buyer types and those four sales models um, so i think probably it'd be a good time to put up the second poll now which is where we we're going to ask you whether you feel you've got the right technology to compete we've already assessed that around about 50 percent of uh people on the in the audience at the moment think that there is a reason to be concerned about online disruptors uh, so if that's the case, do we feel as, a, as an audience that we've got the right technology to compete? And um, I suppose we've got to start to consider now also as retailers, what strategy we, we adopt. Do we stick with a pure physical retail model or do we start to look at that pure showroom online, uh, sorry, pure showroom hybrid model or do we go another way and look at pure online? So understanding that technology and whether we are at this point ready to compete in this space, not necessarily with the full end-to-end -end process, because that's not what is being demanded by the majority at the moment, but at least competing with your own competitor set, who will all be at different levels and different points in that journey in terms of developing that transaction piece online. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'd be great if you could uh, engage with this second poll, but I think now I'll hand back to James, uh, and we'll start to look at some complexities uh, surrounding that online piece. Super. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, I, and exactly, you know, the 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 retail the retail model can be quite a complex thing, and and dealers do generate a lot of profit from other areas, you know, such as finance, price negotiation, and selling selling added value products as well. So I guess, Rob, it's a it's a it's a, it's a choice, isn't it, between a simpler or a more complex part, I guess. Well, um, yes, James, if I could just ask, could you, um, could you bring up the next slide? And I'll, uh, I'll sort of uh, try and answer your question. So what we've, what we've done in Ivendi, and we've done this a, uh, we've done this a number of years now, um, what we do is we take a sample of the many different thousands of uh, transactions which go through our platform each year, and we look at the makeup of that transaction and we also compare it to the last advertised price at the point of transaction on the dealer website. And the reason we do this is to try and understand based on the sophistication of the online journey at that particular point in time, what proportion of those transactions that we've sampled could be accommodated in a pure online journey. Does that make sense? And, you know, as you can see there from the title of this graph, uh, uh, so inherently it's complex and 
most used vehicle transactions, which is what we do the sample on, are inherently complex. If I sort of talk to, talk to each, each of these, so the, the first one there, so I'm gonna start with the easy bit. So just shy of 28% of the transactions that we sampled are easy. And what we mean by that is based on the current sophistication, looking at these transactions from 2020, theoretically, these could be accommodated for in a pure online world. And the reason they could be accommodated in a pure online world is because they're easy. There's no evidence of price negotiation, stroke haggling. There's no part exchange involved. There's no existing outstanding finance settlement. And there's no uh, exchange of uh, value added products being part of that transaction. So theoretically, if you take this as a representative sample, 28% of transactions times a small proportion of your buyers who at this point in time now would fully complete the purchase online and you multiply those two together, that's why I think we're talking about the current state of the market in terms of the kazoos and so on, going after about 10% of the market. That's why it's quite low in real terms. The more interesting bit is if you look at the more complex parts, which can't be facilitated with a, with a complete pure online model. And in 72% of cases, there's some elements of complexity and some real elements of complexity. And this is why when Ivendi talks about connected retailing and we've been talking about the different models to support this, this is why connected, we believe connected retailing as opposed to a pure online retailing model is the way to go. So just looking at the three, we've, we've segmented these complications here into three different segments. So the first one is just sh in just shy of 10% of cases, it was complicated. There was no price negotiation. So dealers were pricing the cars to retail, but there was evidence of a part exchange or a outstanding finance settlement. In 18.5% of cases, it was complicated because there was a definite sign of haggling. So the transaction price of the car was less than the, less, than, than the last advertised price of the car. So definite, definite evidence of haggling, and there may also have been some part exchange or some settlement in there. And think for yourself, if, if there's, there's almost 20% which is still keen on sort of haggling, that's a reasonable number to, uh, to facilitate in a pure online model. But the biggest piece at the bottom was actually the price of the transaction of the vehicle was more expensive than the last advertised price of the car. And that's predominantly down to two factors. The main one being the sale of value-added products, which obviously increases the transaction price, or the existence of outstanding negative, negative equity on a part exchange vehicle. So again, this is, this is why it's complicated. And I mentioned, I mentioned before about, sort of, this is a study we've done numerous times over the last few years at IVND. When we first did it, about 2017, what we actually found is at that point in 2017, a third of the transactions were easy. So the transactions are becoming more complicated, not easier. And the biggest reason for that shift is we've, we've seen during the time as well, a reduction in haggling as it's becoming more normal for, for, for retailers to um, price their vehicles to retail, which reduces the need to haggle. But the biggest fundamental single shift has been in the role of VAPs. And we found a bigger uptake in VAPs. And we suspect that's probably because as more and more retailers have got to price their vehicles ready for retailing, they're becoming more and more reliant on those VAPs as a key source of margin, rather than just relying on the pure metal. James, I think you're going to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I mean, if we take well, all, all the various component parts, I think vehicle, vehicle pricing is an interesting one. And, um, you know, I remember when people were talking about online retailing um, a number of years ago now, seven, eight, nine years ago, if not longer than that, the people said, yeah, yes, I can see how a, uh, a new car would be sold online, but I'll never see how a used car is sold online. And the irony of it is we sell more used cars online than we do new. Um, and that's simply because used vehicles are priced to sell and new vehicles aren't. Um, so I know Richard's going to talk a little bit about agency models later, um, but uh, uh, clearly there is a big issue on new vehicle pricing. I think used vehicles, um, you know, if 38% if of those vehicles were priced to sell um, without negotiation, that makes life a lot easier. Um, but then, of course, then we, we're back on to the, what customers want to see the car, and no one needs to see a brand new car. 
um, technically, uh, but they'll want to see a used vehicle. So we're left with these different dilemmas. Um, I think finance price we've seen from January new regs um, around the banning of discretionary commissions have probably made finance a lot easier going forward. Um, it's uh, uh, although you know we are seeing that you know many dealers are you know are using brokers, which is fine, and I, th I think brokers do have a part to play uh, as an ex broker myself. Um, but I the question is will be is how much business are, are they passing on to brokers there's a good slide you know the broker needs to earn a revenue um and that's just simply coming out of out of, out of commission so can 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 dealers handle more of the process um can they can they manage more of it by having a broader panel of de a broader panel of lenders um i think vaps is going to be key i would think vaps is going to be a number one focus area moving forward um it, it when we look at the revenue in that, and we're recording so many transactions and seeing the amount of VAP sold, or in many cases not sold, um, it's, uh, it is it is significant. And we've got a white paper, which we're hoping to um, launch today on our website. And there's some more detail around VAP sales and in various things that we've seen. And clearly, as long as there is some engagement by the dealer, we are seeing online VAP sales uh, hugely increase, but they don't work in the what I'm going to call uh, traditional online retailing. Uh, and that is this happy path going from vehicle to finance quote to VAPs to buy. Uh, yeah, we're seeing VAPs fall off a cliff, cliff, face, cliff face there. But um, where there's engagement with the dealer, uh, sorry, with the dealer with the consumer and sending deals, it could be digital deals, uh, back to the consumer, we are seeing a much higher VAPS penetration, and in some cases higher than it was pre-COVID. Um, part exchange is an area that we haven't talked too much about today. Uh, and I, I was very conscious of that. And I think we've seen a lot more aggregation services start up, Whizzle, uh, Motorway, um, you know, and ultimately these are going to, these aggregation service effectively disaggregate the traditional sale um, as consumers are looking around for the best price for the part exchange. Um, that is understandable from the consumer perspective, but all these uh, third parties have got to, got to make a profit themselves. They've got to put a buyer's fee on there. If it's an auction house at typically 350 plus logistics, um, I think Whizzle is 200 pounds. I've forgotten how much motorway is, but, but this still leaves the dealer with a prime opportunity to get, to get that vehicle and, and certainly more effort and Neil points out more tools on dealer websites to capture part exchange information um, is going to be key um, and I think ultimately the other one is going to be speed and operational efficiencies um, we all like faster processes um, make it less painless cut out some of the blockers um, and by reducing the operational I suppose to some extent there has been an irony by making the process more slicker during COVID because there's been less people around has possibly led to a better customer outcome as a contentious point. Um, I, I guess we haven't got enough. It's, it's, it's more of a gut feel, that is, or from personal experience. So, uh, but reducing um, operational cost is going to be key going forward um, as well. So I think it's passing over to you, James, because I'm conscious of the time. Yeah, I was then going to jump in and say, yeah, well, the clock's ticking on us. So I guess you know, we've covered a lot of we've covered a lot of ground, but it'll be good to. I guess do what everyone wants to do and look into a crystal ball and look to the future. You know, the, the data has shown as we've been through the present uh, through the, the discussion, but you know, during 2020, 2021, the beginning of and the pandemic, that online activity has increased. But is that something that you expect is going to stay the same or will it go back to how it previously was? Um in terms of online activity, I mean we, we've seen a, a big shift in online applications in Q1 this year, which is not surprising considering that uh, all dealers were shut. Um, if we, so if we look at the, the chart in front, we've got 26% of all transactions through the iVendi platform were carried out where the consumer um, initiated the application online without any dealer involvement uh, or to our knowledge without any dealer involvement. Um, now, if we look back over the last two years, that was 15% Q1 last year in 2020, and it was 10% in Q1 2019. Um, so we have been, we have seen a, a general trend. 
what we need to do is to allow really the last four weeks to wash out properly and, and see what is the trend uh, during Q2. Um, we've also seen digital deals, which is a solution that we launched. Um, we, well, we had it. We officially launched it last April. We had it in pilot for a long time. Um, and this is the ability for a dealer to send deals to the customer and interact with them to manage some of the points that Rob raised around negotiation, the addition of VAPs, managing negative equity. Um, and ultimately that was that engagement started by the dealer, but, but was self-served then by the consumer. And 11% of applications in Q1 were carried out through, through this mechanism. And that's a key game changer for us because we can we can start to manage some of these real complexities that Rob talked about in his slide. Um, what was interesting though, that still 63% of, of the applications were managed via our showroom platform, which I hasten to remember, is probably uh, many cases ac access from home, um, but this would be where um, the customer uh, application was taken over the phone, um, we are aware in some cases, yes, as Richard says, it was taken by uh, uh, Word documents, uh, which is a little dangerous, to say the least. Um, but yeah, we, we've seen this change, huge change in Q1. Um, the question is now, what happens uh, from April the 12th? And do we see a, a drop back? We just don't know. Early signs, it is it, it is sustaining. We are seeing sustained growth in this, you know, or, or the, some of these numbers, but it's still early days yet. We need it to the applications to wash out properly. Okay, so um, if we take a minute then just to think beyond the retailer, what part can lenders and manufacturers play in this? Because they obviously are a significant part of the uh, sales process and have significant influence. So if we look at lenders first. Well, I think the speed of the digital journey when it comes to motor finance is too slow and lenders need to evolve their systems and technology. Rob touched on this earlier, you know, two hours, 20 minutes for a lender decision. It isn't quick enough. Uh, I was talking to somebody um, last week who bought a car from kazoo and he'd actually bought the car from kazoo when i had a meeting with him two weeks prior and he was actually saying, oh, i just bought a car from kazoo this morning and and great you know it'll be delivered at the weekend and when i spoke to him on friday he was still waiting for it to be delivered and i think there'd been a lot of friction in in the finance process so it just sort of hung and where he was expecting because he's not an automotive person where he was expecting the finance just to happen it didn't and the, the screen just had sort of a a whirring wheel saying we'll, we'll be in touch and clearly what was going on behind the scenes was a very manual process so i think the finance piece definitely needs to speed up the good news is many of the lenders we know are working on um ways of improving their technology to support these online and hybrid models better and um, i think pre-approval is going to play a significant part here because actually you know getting the finance deal concluded in a shopping session is going to be quite hard but arguably it doesn't need to be because the vehicle isn't delivered that quickly you know but pre-approval has the advantage of locking the customer in more upstream it creates the uh, impression with the consumer that everything's okay that that deal is sorted and that there's no insecurity about what's happening with the finance and allows the dealer and the lender to kind of have a, a more manual process when it comes to actually concluding the finance element of the deal behind the scenes um, I mean, if you look at our industry, you know, are, are we near an Amazon retail model or are we more like, you know, more complex transaction like buying a house? I think it's more like the latter. It's very complex. So there's a lot that's going to be needing to be done. And, and simply taking uh, digitized e-commerce solutions from other markets and trying to make them fit isn't appropriate. So a lot of technology needs to evolve and, and evolve quickly. And that, that's certainly true for the lenders. When we come to OEMs, we've certainly witnessed, as I know many people have, a uh, changing mindset amongst OEMs to, you know, to, to support this sort of stuff better. Many of them are working hard to open up their data sets, allowing third parties to help them sell and market their products uh, better. Um, one key challenge that I think needs to be overcome is, is new physical inventory. You know, we, we, we know of one example of um, 
one OEM where you know effectively three systems are required to actually be able to get a view of what what inventory is available in in the network. And ultimately, the art here is going to be getting the vehicles to market as soon as possible. Um, and certainly those physical new vehicles that are there that consumers can buy is helping them find those vehicles, but also kind of the pipeline vehicles, the ones that are coming through. The other thing before I wrap up, you know, is pricing. And that was something James touched on earlier. New, new cars generally in the UK are not priced to sell. Many OEMs still rely upon models with heavy discounting at the point of sale. And I think there's a strong likelihood we will start to see some change in this area as we move towards the end of this decade. You know, we're moving certainly in the UK to, you know, a, a market where it's going to be EV only and internal combustion engine vehicles uh, are going to be uh, consigned to the scrap heap. Well, hopefully not quite literally overnight. Um, but, we're, you know, that's going to have impact on, on things like residual values. You know, so as the RVs on traditional um, combustion engine vehicles decline and perhaps RVs on electric vehicles increase with greater confidence in battery life and that kind of thing, we may see OEMs try and support and disguise um, some of this change in RV through maybe some uh, attractive leasing offers or, or, or possibly um, even some kind of subscription models that we might see come into force around the end of the decade. But I don't think there's anything we need to worry about today. That's probably one for four or five years from now, but that's certainly how um, we see things moving. So Neil, I'll hand back to you so you can um, wrap up the final section. Yeah, um, thanks Richard. So I think just a couple of last points from me from a retailer perspective and again uh, it was what we were looking at uh, uh, in imperial days and uh, introducing the online transaction opportunity and then moving into sort of click and collect or deliver to the door even as we went through the the lockdown um, it was clear that it opened up uh, our reach to people with it with outside of the traditional distance individuals are prepared to travel for purchasing a vehicle uh, and prior to prior to online, it was typically 28 miles, and we were always making sure that we had sites that were 50 miles apart to be able to accommodate for those individuals who wanted to travel to view the vehicle. Uh, but that's that's clearly now changed. Um, 50 miles plus now, people will buy cars online. If it's delivered to the door, they'll buy them from anywhere. So I think you need to consider really as retailers how do you expand your reach, how do you expand the market that you're um, you're attacking and digital transaction is the way to go uh ensuring you can accommodate for the customer who just wants to click and collect or a customer that wants to have that car delivered at the door will also help um and i suppose finally as we go through this journey now and the digital transaction it's about trust openness and transparency and what the digital disruptors are doing very well is marketing how easy it is to buy a car online how easy it is to return the car online how much effort and time and work they put into presenting and preparing those vehicles. Um, the fact that it's going to be a no pressure transaction because you're in control, you're in control from the start to the beginning, uh, start to the end. So I think we have to, as an industry, and again, something we were pretty fixated on is becoming very customer centric now and understanding the consumer is more in control than ever. And online reputation management, reviews, everything that you you need to do everything you can to build that trust openness and transparency through that process so the consumer is happy to transact as little as much or all online as possible so i think probably now it's time to hand back to uh james and then maybe uh take a few questions yeah super thank you a lot thanks a lot neil um just before and we have got time to answer a couple of questions on the q a i just want to quickly go back because we ran uh, a second poll uh, during the discussion um, and we were asking do you feel you have the right technology to compete um, I think Georgia do we have there we are there we are as if by magic um, so there's there's a definite maybe going on with that poll answer isn't there you know perhaps but I'll, I'll need to review or invest and uh, based on on the results of that poll um, to the panel um, do you feel that the technology does exist uh, for for people in the industry to succeed as the as as we develop new models? 
I'll, I'll, I'll take that initially. I, I mean, yeah, definitely the technology, the technology exists. I think it's not easy to find a lot of the time. Um, you know, we were at Imperial, we developed some of the technology ourselves. We embedded uh, Ivendi's platform into our process so that we could uh, carry out that transactional piece. So I think the technology exists. It is about picking the right technology for your business, ensuring that there are, uh, you're able to cover off those parts of the journey that may not be seen as purely digital and online. And I've seen that question, I think, from Heidi in the chat there, you know, at what points do people fall out of the digital process? Typically, that's going to be around the part exchange valuation. They may get spooked going through putting their finance details in. And that's where that concierge approach comes in. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to the, the rest of the team here. But, you know, digital technology, does it exist? Yeah, no, Neil, I think you're right. It does. Um, it, it is there. Everything that I think the cinches and the kazoos of the world have um, from a consumer offering is readily available. Um, a lot of it really is taking the technology and getting the most out of it. And and, and it's how uh, adapting processes. Um, I think some of the concierge type services don't really exist because it's not necessarily um, in the DNA of the motor trade at the moment. I think it probably will be over, over the coming months, years. Um, so, yeah, technology is there. Uh, there's always room for improvement. There's always more things we can have, but uh, the principles are all there today. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned the question from Heidi Clark Neil. Um, I'll probably throw this over to you, James. So she was asking, is there any research which indicates uh, what elements within the online car purchase journey cause car buyers to reach out to the concierge uh, stroke contact the dealer? Um, anecdotal, um, I've got on that. And, and part exchange um, was um, for me with the number one point because <clears throat> I'm just not happy with the part exchange price. And that could stop process, but that that was probably more severe, which is people quitting out of the process. So, so uh, having a blunt instrument of here's your price, take it or leave it, I think is a is going to be a problem area. Um, so it's leaving it, it's leaving it open for the customer to go down an, an alternative route to to see if they can get more, perhaps. It, and it depends on the model. If, if it's a if it's a normal retailer that has got um, bricks and mortar. Um, then perfect. Uh, get a, ha, do some sort of self appraisal, uh, restructure a deal, and then send an offer back to the back to the customer, and that could be digital as well, and bring them back online again. That that would be see the perfect solution. Hmm. Okay, super. I think we've got time to answer one more before we have to uh, finish off for the day. Um, I think this one's probably for you, Rob. Uh, Graham Woodward has asked when looking at the high transaction pricing. Uh, when considering complicated transactions, are you factoring in some pricing will be higher than website price purely just for the RFL and not just add-on products? Um, yes, as, 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 as much as we possibly can, assuming both consumers and the dealers put the right information in the right boxes. We, we do break out the transactions into various different components. So assuming the right information has gone into the right boxes, yes, we've accounted for that. Okie doke. And unfortunately, as always, the clock is against us, so we're going to have to draw the webinar to an end. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody who's um, who's logged in and, and uh, joined in with the discussion and the polls. I hope you've got everything out of it that you need to. Um, it, just a reminder that the webinar will be up uh, and available on the IMI website. So if you want to go back to it or push it on to friends and colleagues for them to uh, take a look at as well, it will be up on the IMI website very shortly. And I guess lastly, I need to say thank you to James, Neil, Richard and Rob for all your time this afternoon. James, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Super. And uh, with that, I guess I'll end uh, the webinar. Thanks everyone again for joining and we'll see you again in the future. Cheers. <laughs>